afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Genome VC's 11th annual Don Ricks Distinguished Keynote Address, titled Battle Lines, Fighting COVID-19 at the Intersection of Policy, Treatment, and Prevention. My name is Alex Chetwood, and I am the Education Manager at Genome BC. The keynote address, just so you know, will be getting underway at 5 p.m., but for the next hour, we're thrilled to have this opportunity for direct engagement with Dr. Bonnie Henry and our students and educators from across BC. This will work a lot like the question period that uh, Dr. Henry uses when she answers journalist questions at the end of her daily briefings. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we have tell me that. <laughs> 10 students that have earned the opportunity to submit their questions for Dr. Henry to answer. And this is something that we've done for previous uh, DRDK keynote speakers in person, and it's something that we really wanted to continue, but this time, obviously, in a virtual setting. And why? Uh, well, speaking as a scientist turned education manager and also a gigantic nerd, uh, it is because, for me, science, scientific thinking, and also scientists have a lot to offer everybody, but particularly youth. So powerful ways of understanding the world, tools for how to navigate it, and scientists who inspire and who we can look to as role models, like Dr. Henry. So that's me. I'd now like to invite my boss, Sally Greenwood, <laughs> VP Communications and Societal Engagement at Genome BC, to say a few words about the importance of education to Genome BC as an organization, and to introduce Dr. Bonner Henry herself. Sally. Thank you, Alex, and hello to all of you joining us today. We're excited to be able to provide you with the opportunity to chat with one of BC's most respected leaders. Genome BC's Gene School Education Program is the result of our belief that we have a responsibility to inform, engage, and make omic technology accessible to the leaders of today and tomorrow. Over the past 15 years, Genome BC has provided a variety of resources and experiential learning opportunities free of charge for students and educators across BC. And tonight is one of the examples of the unique outreach we are committed to providing. Our volunteers have traveled to every community in BC over the years, and they all return feeling energized through their interaction with BC students and educators. You are the reason we provide the programming, and it is our hope that you leave tonight's conversation even more inspired than when you joined. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry, British Columbia's public health officer. Dr. Bonnie is perhaps the most well-known and respected public figure in BC today. She will be given a formal introduction at the opening of tonight's keynote address. But for now, I will just say, that she is eminently qualified to be guiding us through the COVID-19 pandemic and the opioid crisis. She earned her MD from Dalhousie Medical School and completed a master's in public health in San Diego. Her expertise has taken her to Pakistan, where she worked on polio eradication and Uganda in Ebola control with the World Health Organization and UNICEF. She was the operational lead in response to SARS outbreak in Toronto before joining the BC Center for Disease Control as medical director where I had the pleasure of meeting and working with her. We are so very lucky that she calls BC home. Please welcome Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here and I'm very excited for the opportunity to, uh, however virtually, to talk with uh, young people and I think that has been an important part of this last year in particular. Um, I know it has been an incredibly challenging year and no more so than for, for young people but I've also been really heartened by how, how resilient and adaptive um, young people are and how we're being really innovative in getting through this year. And uh, I, I just want to say, that, you know, 2020 will be defined by this pandemic, but it doesn't define us and it doesn't define you as, uh, as youth. And we can learn from this and we can take things from this year that will help us um, build back a better way of, of creating and being together and learning together. And we need to, to focus on those special things that we have learned through this hardship that we're going through now and making sure that we take that with us as we're moving forward into the next years. And, and the things that we're doing now, they're not forever, but they will be for some months to come. So we have some time to think through this. And I just want to encourage everybody to to think big, think about the things that we're going through now and how that is going to be part of your life and what can you make of that uh, for the future. 
and be curious. I think we have um, stimulated a whole new uh, interest in epidemiology, and every time I present data, I get lots of comments from people who, who critique the data. But you know what? These are really cool and interesting things that, um, you know, when I look back on, on being in school and being in university, just having that curiosity about how things work and how things come together and being able to find a way in my world, and it happens to be medicine and then epidemiology and communicable diseases and understanding like being a disease detective is something that I'm really keen <laughs> about. And, and that's kind of nerdy, I guess, but <laughs> to be able to, um, to translate those uh, concepts that we have around data and what does it actually mean to those of us in real life. So I'm really excited to be here and to be able to answer your questions today. Great. So are you ready? Yes. Okay. Right. Um, we're going to start. Our first question comes from Alice Stansu, and she's a grade 8 uh, student at Point uh, Secondary School in Vancouver. And uh, Alice's question is about BC's case numbers compared to other provinces, particularly in the early days of the pandemic. So is there a video? Or Hi, Bonnie Henry. My name is Alice, and here is my question for you. When compared to other provinces, what has British Columbia done differently that has led us to not having as many cases? Yeah, that's a really good question. I get asked that by the by the media quite a lot too. And I really think that we, when we were prepared, as you know, we were looking at this all across the country, but having a good, strong uh, group of people that recognized that what was going on in China was unusual and different and that we needed to be prepared and to think about it. But I also think, you know, as we went into March, and I've thought a lot about this, um, watching what was coming, when things were spreading, making sure we had our lab colleagues on the ground being able to develop a lab test, that we had connections internationally so we could have a, a sense of what was going on and connecting with our colleagues across the country too. And part of it was timing. You know, we did have a very good sense of when people were coming into BC and being able to pick it up. And part of it was, I think, luck. You know, we, we made the right decisions at the right time. And, and Louis Pasteur, who's somebody that I always admire, he, he, um, coined, he said, you know, luck favors the prepared mind. And uh, the fact that we were thinking about potentials that could happen. So we put in measures very quickly in a very short period of time. But we had to have people prepared about that uh, too. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about it ahead of time. Great. Our next question comes from a student at Gladstone Secondary here in Vancouver. His name's uh, Neve Elian. Does the infection and recovery not guarantee immunity from the virus? Should the public be concerned or aware about this issue? And how may this new information affect the vaccinations being developed and their effectiveness? Excellent question, and we are learning. Uh, this virus has been around, as far as we know, at least in North America since probably uh, January, um, and it's behaving a lot like other coronaviruses. So we can learn a little bit from that, which means its incubation period is kind of long. We do develop antibodies. We've been measuring those antibodies, but we've also learned that we don't yet know all of the tricks about our immune system, which is very complex and how we respond to this virus and whether that immunity is going to last for um, weeks or months or years. And the best that we know now is it's probably months at least. And as we learn more about it, we'll know more as, as things go on. Um, but we, we actually have an, what we call an immunity task force here in Canada, which is linking with all of the data around the world to try and understand this very question. It's really the heart of will a vaccine work? How often will you need it? Um, will you have to have booster shots? Will you have to have a, will it be like influenza where we have a booster shot every year? And I think the answers are starting to come in. Yes, we, we do have some immunity. Most people, particularly if you've had um, symptoms, um, then you have immunity for a period of time, probably at least months. Um, and it stimulates several parts of our immune system. So antibodies are one, but there's also what we call cell-mediated immunity, so another part of our immune system. And it looks like that may be long, longer lasting. So that helps us understand that, yes, uh, vaccines will probably work, 
Um, the other thing we're following with genome sequencing is how, how frequently is this virus changing? And it's not changing quickly like we see with influenza. So that tells us that probably we're going to have a vaccine that works, probably not going to be needed every year, um, but we don't know how frequently it might be needed or whether we'll need a booster shot, probably likely. And yes, we'll probably have immunity that will last for at least a couple of years. Great. This next question, there's no video, but I'm going to ask it on behalf of uh, Ariana Loughton. She's a grade 8 student in South Kamloops Secondary. Ariana asks, how close are scientists to finding a cure or a vaccine for COVID-19? Mm. The million dollar question. You know, we have very few cures for viruses. We have lots of cures, uh, antibiotics for, uh, uh, for bacteria, but antibiotics don't work against bugs. Right. <laughs> we have a program we talk about, Some do bugs need drugs? Need drugs so. Um, so we don't have drugs for, uh, that can cure this virus. We're, there's lots of work being done around the world to see if there's things that we can give people that will help them recover more quickly and prevent them from having severe illness or dying from the virus. And that's uh, some really great work. But right now, no, we don't have a cure. How close are we to a vaccine? When we are closer to a vaccine in the shortest period of time we can possibly imagine for the first time ever. <laughs> right. So normally it would take 10 to 15 years to develop a vaccine. Mm -hmm. And the global community, scientific community, has been really working together. And the safety people, so at Health Canada here in Canada, the safety people who look at all the data about um, how the vaccines are working um, have been speeding up their processes too, which tells us that you know there's, there's, no, um, there's no reason, there's no physical reason why we can't do this faster in real time. But because we're in a crisis, we are doing it faster. And there's about 159, and last I checked, different vaccine candidates that are in the pipeline. And there's a, a number of them, at least seven, that are in what we call phase two or three trials, which means we're testing them on humans to see if they work in humans. And there's at least four of them that are, uh, have got some good early preliminary results. So we don't have a vaccine yet, but I fully expect, I, I believe that by uh, the first quarter of next year, and so that's rather technical, but sometime around <laughs> February, March of next year, we're going to have at least the beginnings of some vaccines that will be available to people in Canada. That's great news, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah. It won't be everybody <laughs> all at once, um, and we're going to have to look at how we, you know, who do we do we protect most? It depends on who the vaccines how work in. How you prioritize in, it, but right? How do we prioritize yeah. it? We want to um, protect those people, particularly our elders and seniors, because we know they're the people that are more likely to have severe illness or die. So we need to protect them first, and how do we do that is something that we are talking about across this country right now. Yeah, and our next student actually, um, Annika Clark, a grade 10 student from Urban Academy in New West, has a question a little bit around vaccine distribution as well, so I'll let her. Hi, I'm Annika, I'm in grade 10, and my question is, once there's a vaccine, will it be available for people of all social classes? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, you bring up a really good point. And one of the things that we have here in Canada is a universal health care system. So, and yes, this vaccine will be available for free for everybody in Canada. And I say that specifically mm -hmm. in Canada because it's not just Canadian citizens, it's all of our community here in this country. And we are committed to that. And we have what we call an ethical process that looks at making sure that we have these types of important life-saving measures available to everybody who needs it here in the country. So yes, it will be available to everybody. It's going to take some time. Um, you know, we, it's going to take time to manufacture enough doses for people and then to distribute it and to get it. Right now, most of it are injectable, so get it into people's arms. But mm -hmm. we are doing all of that planning now to try and do it as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And you know, the good point that you brought up, Annika, is that uh, this virus has, this pandemic has shown us that some people are affected more than mm -hmm. others by the virus, but also by the measures that we put in place to try and control it. And that means particularly what we call racialized populations, so people from visible ethnic groups, um, indigenous peoples in Canada, um, some groups have had suffered more than others. And we need to make sure that they have um, equitable access to treatment, to care, and to vaccine. 
Thank you. So the next question doesn't have a video attached to it, uh, but it comes from Nate Booth, who's a grade 10 student again out in the valley this time in Agassi. And he wants to know if you think the virus might mutate again and what that means. Yeah, well, with it, like every virus. Mm -hmm. So this is an RNA virus, which means like we have DNA. We have a double strand of nuclear material. And this virus is an RNA virus, so it has a single strand, which means that it doesn't have a spell check, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. So when it replicates, it can miss beats and skip things and misspell things when it replicates. So when it inserts that RNA into our cells and replicates, we get changes. And when we look at influenza, for example, it has eight tiny genes that can change, and it's also an RNA virus, so it can change really rapidly and gets all kinds of spelling errors. This one's a little longer. It doesn't change quite as frequently, so it doesn't get those errors quite as often. Um, so what we're seeing from looking at the sequencing over time is that it does change and mutates, but it's not mutating really rapidly. Um, it mutates enough so that we can tell if somebody brought it over from Italy versus Iran, but it's uh, not so much that we can tell if people are uh, between one day and the next. <laughs> so that helps us understand whether immunity will last longer and whether vaccines will work. Um, but right now we're seeing it mutate slowly um, and who knows, maybe it'll mutate to become less virulent, not make people as sick. Um, we've seen that with other coronaviruses that cause severe illness and then sort of faded away over time. So I think you've already answered this question, but just yeah. to build on that, we know that what we saw coming from Iran was different than what we yeah. saw from Washington versus Wuhan. So um, is it safe to say, though, that the one vaccine will work for all? Yeah, so that's, that's a really important point because the things that we try to develop vaccines for are parts of the virus that don't change. Mm -hmm. And there are, what the, mostly what they're looking at is what we call a spike protein. So, you know, you see the picture of the virus and it's got these little spiky things um, poking out. And that is relatively conserved, even though other parts of the virus may change and different proteins are um, sort of slowly change. The spike protein seems to be relatively conserved over time. So most of the vaccines are aimed at that. Okay, great, thank you. And I've got another question coming up. This time it's, we have a video for it, and it's from Kay Lee, who's a grade 11 student from Elgin Park Secondary out in Surrey. Hey, Dr. Henry. My question is that during the study of COVID-19, have you found any similarities between the structure of the COVID-19 cells and the various cells that had been involved in previous pandemic in humans? And will there be a breakthrough in the prevention of viral diseases that spread quickly, such as COVID-19, in the future? Oh, now, also a really incredibly <laughs> good question, man. Um, so the, the shorter answer is yes and no. Um, so coronaviruses uh, um, do, we, we've have, we have four coronaviruses that we know of, they have really exciting names like OC54 um, that <laughs> circulate every year um, and cause mild colds, um, colds and flus. So um, the previous pandemics that we've had, that we've had recorded history about in the last hundred years, and 1918 is the, is the one that we know them, it has been the most severe, have been uh, pandemics of influenza, which is a, a, a different virus. They're both viruses, but a different family, um, different RNA material. And influenza caused 1918, 1919, a very severe pandemic. It caused pandemics in 1968, in um, 1957, 1968, and again in 2009, which is a relatively mild influenza pandemic, H1N1. You remember that one? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I remember that one. <laughs> we did a lot of this. So what we know, though, is that um, there's thought that uh, in the late 1800s there was a pandemic that was thought to be influenza but in retrospect it might have been a coronavirus and we know that uh, in 2003 there was a coronavirus that uh, mutated from or that moved from bats to civet cats 
to humans, and that caused uh, the SARS outbreak in uh, 2003. That was, um, I happened to be in Toronto for that one. Uh, so we learn from each of these, and what we learn is that, uh, that wh who, where the virus lives when it's not infecting humans, and there's been a lot of work done, particularly in China after the SARS outbreak in 2003, to try and find out more about coronaviruses. Um, so they've always been on our radar as things that could cause quite severe pandemics. I think in 2003, we were able to push it back into nature. So it was no longer circulating in humans. And I know many of us were very hopeful that we would be able to do that with this coronavirus too. But this one is different enough. It's not, it doesn't cause as severe illness, but it's much more infectious than SARS. And it's less infectious than influenza. It doesn't spread quite the same way influenza does, like infecting everybody, but mm. it is more severe. Mm. So each one of them tends to be different, and we learn uh, a lot every time they arise. But what we do know is that that human um, animal interface and the environment that we're in makes a huge difference in the ability for these viruses to pass between animals and humans and that's what we call zoonoses um, mm -hmm. and we've been paying a lot of attention to that in the last few years this kind of one health model that we need to be aware of the animals, uh, the birds, the bats, uh, bats are harbors for a lot of viruses um, and our environment. And there's conditions in the environment that make it more likely that a virus will pass from a bat or uh, an animal to a human, and then it can adapt to spread quickly between humans. So we learn from every single one. Um, sometimes we can't predict which, what's going to arise, um, but it does help us understand. Sounds like you've got like a million balls in the air in a long time and you're just trying <laughs> well, to find yeah, a really important one. You know, one. The, the concept of, you know, one of the things I think we need to learn out of this is how do we um, uh, look at the effects that climate change exactly. has had that make it that we're at that human-animal interface more often. And in, uh, Ebola is one of the viruses mm -hmm. that is very uh, related to that because when humans have gone into forested areas where the Ebola virus tends to live and probably in bats, although we don't know that for sure. And you know, this is kind of the things that we do as in epidemiologists. We kind of trace back, well, who gave it to who and where did they get it from? And uh, the, the, the major Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014 uh, was likely uh, a young boy who disturbed some bats in a tree and the bats were carrying Ebola virus. They don't get sick with it, but uh, the child got sick and then it spread within his community and other places. And then, so there's the things that we do, and there's the things that the human um, environment interface that make things more likely to happen too. Yeah, you have to be a detective. Yeah. Right? Yeah, very much so. We've got, we've got another question here from Casey Bell, and I'm, I'm wondering if you've already answered it in the previous oh, okay. question. <laughs> um, but he's also from the Urban Academy in the US. We got a lot of our questions from there. He's in grade nine. Um, and he wants to know what makes COVID-19 so different from other viruses like H1N1, which you yeah. already touched on. Um, and maybe because this, this is students and a lot of them have to do like the way viruses look, maybe you can talk a little bit about sure. what makes different viruses different to each other. Yeah, it's, it's almost like families. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so viruses are all, um, they're, they're, they have a lot in common in that they only have uh, small pieces of genetic material, sometimes double-stranded and sometimes RNA or single-stranded ones, but they can't live on their own. They have to hijack our own body's cells or an animal's cells to reproduce. So they can't live out in the environment on their own. Um, so they get into our cells and they insert themselves into our DNA, our, our cell reproduction mechanism, and they make millions of copies of themselves <laughs> and then they get into our bloodstream and they spread to more cells and then we spread it to others through um, well in terms of coronaviruses and this is one thing so we have a, a class of what we call respiratory viruses and coronaviruses like COVID-19 fit into the respiratory viruses so they generally attack the, the lungs and the upper nose and they make us cough and sneeze and have fevers um, this one is slightly different in that it, it, it attaches to 
um, uh, the, these cells that are in uh, in our blood vessels as well. So mm -hmm. it can cause blood clotting, and we've been finding out that it can cause problems with um, heart attacks and other things too, which is slightly different. So of the respiratory viruses, we have coronaviruses like SARS, which caused the outbreak in 2003. We have one called MERS, which mm -hmm. is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, uh, which is a coronavirus that um, lives in camels. <laughs> and in those, <laughs> when, when we don't see a lot of that here because <laughs> uh, camels, but we see it pass between camels and humans in the Middle East in particular, and Saudi Arabia and Yemen and some of those countries. Um, and then we have COVID-19. And then we have a couple of others that cause really mild colds. Uh, then we have influenza, which are sort of cousins, I guess. They're all respiratory viruses. And influenza circulates every year. And it's starting, we're starting into our influenza season where we, um, where we tend to see several mm -hmm. strains of influenza. And this year, all of the things that we're doing to prevent COVID will prevent influenza too. But for influenza, we have a vaccine and that's going to be important too. And then we have a whole bunch of cold viruses. We have ones called RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, which can cause, particularly in young people, cause very severe illness. And then we have adenoviruses and enteroviruses, and they're the ones that give you a runny nose all winter and a <laughs> little bit of a cough sometimes, and they don't make you as sick. But they're all in that big family of respiratory viruses. But we also have all kinds of really other neat viruses that cause, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's the bloodborne ones that cause things like Ebola. Uh, we have ones that cause uh, uh, winter vomiting disease, you know, one of the famous things, so like gastroenteritis, right. um, noroviruses that uh, go through schools sometimes. And we have things too, like close to home, like avian yeah. influenza, right? Yeah. So avian influenza, we, we, you know, we've seen some evidence that's of right. that in the Fraser Valley and poultry farms are affected and... That's right. So right? that's a new strain of influenza. So the things we know about influenza is some of them affect humans, but all of them affect birds. And there's different strains that get into birds and they can cause problems with um, domestic poultry, exactly. like chickens and, and turkeys. And we've seen that happen yeah. too. Yeah. Complicated, very the world complicated. world of viruses. <laughs> it is, it's exciting though. Um, so our next question comes from Amy Mo. Amy is a grade eight student from Point Grey Secondary in Vancouver. Hi, Dr. Henry. My name is Amy Mo, and I'm from Point Grey Mini School in Vancouver. My question for you is, humanity has battled against countless of viruses throughout history. Yet even with the advancements in healthcare, this virus has affected our lives in ways we have never imagined. So how can we protect ourselves against viral outbreaks and pandemics in the future? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, I have to say that some of us have actually been thinking about how this would affect us for a long time. And, um, I, I, and I will say as somebody who spent 30 years <laughs> working on what are the things that we need to do to keep people safe from viral infections, um, whether they cause respiratory illness or Ebola or polio, which is in the stomach and attacks the nerves, you know, things like um, being able to detect them. And one of the things that we, uh, that we, we relied on was a, a a global network of laboratories that tested people that we monitor and do surveillance. And when in, we say surveillance in, our, in the public health world, we mean um, the, the systematic testing and tracing and finding of, of what's out there making people sick. And our surveillance networks are across the province and across the country and across the globe. And right now we can um, find out, you know, there's a measles outbreak in this country or there's and now COVID, of course, has gone around the world. And we came up with um, potential scenarios of how a virus could cause the types of things that we're seeing. Um, and we base it on influenza, because influenza, we do know, has caused at least four pandemics in the last century. Um, and the nice thing about influenza is we have vaccines that can be developed relatively quickly. So we will learn from this virus that um, that we need to keep up with those plans. What we learned was that we get complacent over time and it's very hard to spend the money on prevention when things are, uh, when we have challenges meeting the day-to-day -day needs in our health system even. So we didn't have necessarily the amount of PPE that we needed to protect healthcare workers. 
um, that had been whittled away. Uh, our stockpiles of things like antiviral medications, which would be useful for influenza, not for this virus, unfortunately, although we tried, um, mm -hmm. those have been whittled away. So it's really focused attention again on how we as a global community need to be prepared. Mm -hmm. And we need to, um, I think one of the tragedies we've seen is that when countries pull back and, and only look at themselves, that uh, low and middle income countries suffer more. So uh, in my mind, I believe we need to boost the, the work that we do with the World Health Organization to support all countries and all people around the world. And I will say, um, you know, here in, in BC, we've done a lot about our relationship with indigenous peoples in BC. And uh, I, uh, there's an elder, um, Pauline Waterfall, who's a health sick elder, who said to me, you know, we talk about it being unprecedented, but it, it's not in Indigenous and First Nations communities. With every, um, with every pandemic that's come, whether it's smallpox or influenza, First Nations people have been differentially negatively affected. Right. And to call it unprecedented um, takes that history away. It is precedented in First Nations communities, but it also shows the resiliency and the strength of communities. And we've been working together to make sure that this time um, we can do everything we can to make sure First Nations communities aren't negatively affected more than other populations as well. Right, super important. Kelly Jin is a grade 10 student at RA McMath Secondary, and she has a question about the importance of public health. Hi, Dr. Harry. I'm Kelly Jean, a grade 10 student from RA McMahon Secondary School in Richmond. How do you think this global pandemic will change people's opinion on public health? Well, <laughs> you're asking me. <laughs> this is my life. <laughs> you know what? Um, I hope that will um, it, it will um, raise people's awareness of the work that we do in public health. It's very easy. If we're doing our job well, um, we're protecting people's health, whether it's getting your immunization programs, making sure restaurants are safe to eat at, our drinking water is safe. The things we do in public health are across the board. You know, we have healthy heart programs, mm -hmm. all of those things, uh, the, you know, participation, getting out in sports and road safety. Those are all part of the work that we do in public health. But when there's, um, when there's challenges, particularly in our health care system, and you know, there's trouble, people have long waiting lists, it's very easy to, to sort of whittle away at the work that public, public health does. So I'm hopeful we'll recognize how important it is that we have this, um, uh, this troop of, of people, and I, you know, the face of many, many good people, as you know, who have been working day and night to, to manage this pandemic. And our public health workforce is fascinating, interesting work. Mm -hmm. There's disease detectives that are out there every day finding every case and finding out who they got it from so that we can stop um, transmission. And you know that is so important work. Um, and uh, after the SARS outbreak in 2003, I remember going to, a, a, there was a conference about communications and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. And there was some um, media people who said, well, you know, uh, there, there's this crisis and all of a sudden these public health people come out of the woodwork. <laughs> and it's like, you know, that, that's true. But we are there. We're the, we are the woodwork. You know, we're that safety net, that, uh, uh, that last resort that is out there every day. Um, trying to prevent diseases from passing between people, making sure kids are immunized, making sure that when we have a case of salmonella, we find out you know, what food it was in so we can stop other people from getting sick. And, and I'm kind of hopeful that this will uh, inspire lots of young people as well to take on uh, some of the things that we're doing and to think of being in public health as a, as a really interesting and fun and exciting career. Well, I'm completely biased, right? So I had the opportunity to work at BCCDC for seven years. And I have to say that for me, the BC Center for Disease Control is like a jewel in the crown of BC's healthcare system. And I think the risk is that public health and, and the work that goes on at places like the BC Center for Disease Control get overlooked until there's a crisis. Exactly. And so I think the challenge is for all of us, and especially for an organization like Genome BC as a, as a funder and, and, and somebody who has an opportunity to inform and speak with our government officials as well, is just to keep reminding people that 
we have to stay on top of it and it yeah. needs to be funded uh, you know, consistently and uh, we need to be able to we need to look and leverage and call upon the expertise that's there because it's immense it it's is. truly immense and the the amazing things that we do I mean I think of all the the fun things that I've done yeah. the, you know, when we had West Nile virus and you know I know more about species of mosquitoes than I had the life cycle of a mosquito in the northern hemisphere exactly. than Lyme you would ever disease. imagine. And, I mean it's Lyme fascinating disease. work, it's truly fascinating yeah. work. It is, and, yeah. um, but it is much under the radar until there's a crisis yeah. and um, that means that sometimes we don't have, you know I look at a bank and if they didn't have a redundant system they would be considered a failure but in our health system and in public um, bodies like like the BC CDC like uh, uh, my office you know redundancy is seen as waste and mm -hmm. we have to whittle away and try and make sure but we need to have people with the expertise for these times um, and then, you know, I'm happy to fade back into blissful obscurity <laughs> at some point, <laughs> knowing that there'll be people to take, take on the charge. Yeah, one of the things you talked about this morning, actually, we focused a lot on vaccines and disease section mm. epidemiology and like the, the, like the hard science type of angle to COVID-19. One of the things you talked about was the importance of like the behavioral sciences mm -hmm. and psychology and the communications aspects. Could you maybe say a few sure. things about what you said this morning? Because yeah. it's really interesting. Uh, so I think it is important, um, and I've learned from my experiences that that how we support people to to have agency, to know what to do, um, to know that you can do something to protect yourself in the face of something that's unknown and scary, and is, you know we're seeing the headlines and we're seeing what's happening in places like China and Italy, and it's going to happen here. Um, it's so important to understand how we can communicate what we need um, and how we can support people. And I, I really believe that words matter and how we mm. approach things matters and it, it, understanding that we're in this together, that it's not, we can't other people. And we know that when people are in crises, there's many things that they do. Some people just want to run away. And certainly I was there in March. <laughs> if there was any place that I could run to, I would have. But <laughs> No, you wouldn't. <laughs> no. But, and there's some people who, um, you know, hunker down. And some people, uh, it really breeds altruism. Mm -hmm. And that means helping of others and the compassion for others. And we saw a lot of that, whether it was banging pots or, or going out and getting groceries for your neighbor, supporting an older person down the street so they didn't have to go out when it was really scary, um, you know, those are the things that we want to, to foster in people. For some people, it, it's um, their way of coping is by saying, oh, that's somebody else's problem and or it's those people. And we've seen, uh, tragically, quite a bit of that too, you know, people um, not wanting to go to Asian restaurants or making fun mm -hmm. of uh, or saying nasty things to, to people who look Asian on the street or, uh, and you know, those types of things we need to minimize because it's not going to help us get through this and it's, it only makes it harder for some people than others. And I've been saying this from the beginning, you know, we need to recognize that we are all in this storm together globally, but we're not all in the same boat. And we don't always know why somebody is acting the way they do. And we can be responsible for how we respond and what we do. And so my job, part of my job, is to give people the words to do that and to understand why it's okay, um, you know, that I can keep my distance, that, uh, that I can wear a mask when it's appropriate, that if somebody's upset and angry, that it may be because they're just holding on mm -hmm. and they don't know where the next meal is gonna come from. Mm -hmm. But I can help by just being calm and being kind to each other, and that's what keeps us all safe. Thank you. So we're going to leave COVID-19 and the pandemic behind okay. a little bit now and <laughs> turn the attention on you <laughs> <laughs> for our last uh, series of questions. So our final student question, which doesn't have a video attached to it, comes from Sonia Whip, who's a grade nine student from Urban Academy again. And she would like to know, how long did you go to school <laughs> and to get to where you are now? And how did you remain motivated? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, I did the usual school. My, my father was in the military, so I moved around a whole mm. bunch of times. So I went to a lot of schools yeah. <laughs> all over the country, and I lived in, in Europe world, for a while, yeah. which was kind of cool. 
Um, but then I went to, let's see, I went to undergrad university at Mount Allison, so that was another three years, and then medical school was another four years at Dow, and then uh, we, I did, uh, um, to be a, a practicing physician, you had to do an internship year, so that was another year, so what's that up to, <laughs> I think? A lot. <laughs> and then I went back and did a, uh, after I was in practice for a while, and I was in the Navy as a physician for a while, um, I went back to school and did a master's degree in public health, and I did a specialty training in public health and preventive medicine, so that was another five years. So. Lots of time, but you know what? It was finding, uh, staying curious. I really knew I wanted to go into medicine, and so, and I was really cool in science and kind of nerdy about that. And then undergrad, I took bio biology and chemistry, and mm -hmm. um, but I always took some arts as well because I think you need to have both. And universities, um, it, you know, when you go through, especially in high school, right? It, there's things that you need to learn. Um, that are kind of like a, a building block or a basis or a foundation, but they're not all that's out there in the world. There's so many things that we can do that you would never learn or hear of necessarily in high school. And when you get to university, if you go to university, that's you know one of those places where you should learn how to learn. Um, and it, it, to me, it was really important to read a lot and to, um, to get into literature, and I still do that. I have like a whole stack of books that I think I'm going to read, but I haven't been able to for 10 months. But, <laughs> um, but if you, you know, literature and understanding words and language, I, I believe, were something that helped me be a better doctor, um, helped me communicate things. And then, uh, yeah, I, I, once I got through medical school, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I was a, a, a family doctor, which I loved, and I worked in the Navy for quite a long time, mm -hmm. which was really interesting. Got to go diving and, and flying in <laughs> F-18s and all kinds of fun stuff. Wow. Um, and then I got really interested in, in public health. And it was uh, one of my mentors and teachers when I was working in San Diego in the inner city community clinic with um, disadvantaged people and she was like look at how you approach things you you need to go into public health and part of it was when I was in the Navy we, I was out at sea of the ship and we had an outbreak of this gastrointestinal disease and I was able to sort of trace it back mm -hmm. to the water that we took on board in this mm -hmm. island anyway so that kind of stuff really s s stuck with me but it took some time and mm -hmm. it takes time you can experiment and find things but I really love the work that we do in public health and so that's what keeps me motivated now <laughs> yes. and has for quite a long time. Sounds like a desire to just help yeah. people came maybe quite early on and yeah. just kept continuing. And I even wrote a book on it. Oh, did you? <laughs> I didn't even did. <laughs> Called Soap and Water and Common Sense. Soap and Water and Common Sense. <laughs> uh, who gets to go first? You. Me. Perfect. Okay. So, yeah, I'm, I'm always interested. I never get really chance to talk to a famous person, so. <laughs> um, no pressure. <laughs> yeah. I'm really curious to know if there's any experiences earlier on in your life that kind of started to nudge you towards science and public health and disease detection. Yeah, you know, I, uh, that's funny because I, I've always been kind of a sciencey, nerdy person. I was thinking that my sister and I were talking about this. I have, a, I have three sisters. <laughs> One is older than me and, you know, is the number two child where <laughs> you're just sort of <laughs> you're not used to being in the spotlight. Um, so, but I was always the one out there, you know, climbing trees, building Lego, um, and catching salamanders and snakes, <laughs> which my mother was not appreciative of. Um, but we were also very curious and, and readers uh, as children. Um, my sister will tell the story that when she was, I think, eight or nine, uh, she had appendicitis and was in hospital and had her appendix out. And my coming to visit her, and, and I, of course, remember this vividly too, but it was kind of like, aha, this is what I want to do. Mm. <laughs> it wasn't about the, the, the nursing, the caring. It was like, ooh, you, like, you can cut somebody open and take it out <laughs> and it makes them better. <laughs> it's like the fascination with that. So that's probably one of my earliest <laughs> inclinations. Cool. But then the, you know, the disease detective stuff, the epidemiology, yeah. the, you know, the being able to figure it out about why somebody got sick, and it's not just infectious diseases, we do it for you know, toxins. Why, uh, you know, what was it that uh, created that? Uh, there's, there's lots of different things that we can do. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're talking about kind of like that moment of discovery, but I can't imagine that you're existing in the job you're in now 
maybe there's a bit of discovery, but there's also all this other stuff. Like, do you still manage to get those kind of moments of realization where you're like, ah? I do, but it's it's not about uh, it's not at the molecular level. No. <laughs> you know, it's uh, when uh, I mean this pandemic is a good example. It, it really became clear to me that we were going to see cases here in BC, and that was just past experience and. You know, talk, and I was like, the aha, I need to prepare. We need to do this. Um, my colleagues, um, many of whom, I, I, we have some really great public health leaders here, uh, but being able to call them up and say, all right, this is what it's we need time. to go on this path. Um, being able to make those decisions and calls in a way that the minister and the premier understood as well is part of what comes with your experience, with my experience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's been quite a few of those aha moments, you know, being able to build on your experience and say, here's the potentials, and so this is what we need to prepare for. And um, it's been, I mean, I don't do this alone, clearly. <laughs> there's a lot of other people who are involved with this and, and who've done a tremendous amount of work. But those are the types of things when y y you, you see something that triggers the experience that you've had before and you recognize that if we don't do this, we're going to be in trouble or we need to move on along this path versus that path. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, would you have seen, could you have seen yourself in this position doing what you're doing now? Mm. <laughs> 20 years ago was just before <laughs> SARS <laughs> and of course it was 9-11 and oh. all of those things. But did you kind of see a trajectory? To, because oh. you, you've taken you know, each mm. position and each different job that you've taken, yeah. I mean, if you, if you plot the course, did you, did you have a plan? Uh, or was a lot of didn't it have a plan. just opportunities that presented themselves? You know, I think it was, again, <laughs> opportunities, but also um, sort of following the, the things that I knew were, I was passionate about or mm -hmm. interested in. Um, and, and meeting people, and I think we, we underestimate sometimes how influential people are in our lives. And uh, so having the opportunities to work with people, to, um, to take on leadership roles, which is not something, I, I, mean, I guess I've always been a bit bossy, but, <laughs> <laughs> but so in a good way, I hope. Um, but it's, uh, it's always been a challenge to take on leadership roles. Still, it is a challenge for women to take on mm -hmm. leadership roles. And that has been something that I've learned about. I've learned that it's okay to be right. It's okay to say no. It's okay to take up my space and not uh, apologize for it. But that's taken a lot of learning and, and support. And it's support from other uh, women in particular, but also from um, male colleagues. And that's, that's a challenge still. Any advice for young women, girls out there who have trouble speaking out, who, who find it hard to have their voice heard? Well, I, I can say I've been there and I'm still there and <laughs> I am an introvert and, and it takes a lot of energy out of me to do the media briefings every day and, um, and I need to find my time afterwards. I often just go home, I read a book, or I, I do meditation, I run, yeah, you know, we, I need those things by myself to, to recharge. And there's some great people who are good leaders who, uh, who basically get their energy from being out in the public. Of that. yeah. <laughs> and, that's, and that's good. But I think as, as you know, especially um, young girls, young women, it's okay to be interested in something and to be, um, to go, uh, to talk about it, to be on the front about it, to be upfront about it, to be curious and, and to speak your mind and ask questions and don't apologize for that. And it takes some courage sometimes, but the more you do it, the more you can adapt and you can be okay with doing it. Mm -hmm. And we need to support each other in doing that. And whether you, it's, um, you know, no matter what gender you identify with, we need to support each other in um, celebrating our differences and acknowledging and, and just being okay with that mm -hmm. um, and not putting it down. And I think all of us have to take that on. Um, and times of crises, those are really important times for us to, to remember that, that we are, you know, we are human beings together and our differences are, are what make us um, stronger as a community. Yeah, great information. And to my daughters who I think are listening mm -hmm. today, Dr. Henry says you need to read more books. <laughs> um, so your career has prepared you well for the pandemic. 
But the spotlight has probably never shone so brightly on you mm -hmm. as an individual before. Um, what is that like for you? And what and how do you really cope with that on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, um, I'm just looking at this spotlight right here, which is making me a little... <laughs> it's hot. Uh, it has been, um, yeah, it, it, that part of it has been a little freaky in a sense, um, people recognizing me. And, you know, I'm just really grateful. Most people are so kind and very helpful. And, you know, I do get some nasty stuff. And mm. that is really difficult to deal with. And, and I think what's important and what's important for, for young people to know is when people are nasty like that, it's, you need to talk to somebody. And I've done that. I've talked with um, people in, at work, I, <laughs> the security people. Yeah. Um, you know, at first we, we want to minimize it and we don't want to accept that somebody might be targeting us. But it, it is important to, to call it out and say it's not okay, it's not right. And there are people who will help you with that. So that is something I've had to learn. Um, but most people are just really, really kind. And they are appreciative of the work that we're doing. And I recognize every time that I'm in the public eye that I'm speaking for a team, and a really great team, a public health team and health care team for the most part. Um, you know, that, that, that my, my team, or my team, the team of public health people in this province are, are amazing, mm -hmm. and in this country. And I know that, and sometimes that is a bit of a burden to bear too, that you know, that I'm reflecting the, the amazing work that they're doing. And that's part of my job and part of my responsibility too. So I, I think there's a little bit of, you know, the, the Dr. Bonnie Henry, and then mm -hmm. there's the me that runs away and gets <laughs> yeah. into my jammies. And then <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's important for people to recognize that, though, right? Yeah, um, it takes courage. It does take courage, and I think you know I've been talking about you know being kind and being calm mm -hmm. and being uh, being safe, uh, and I've added to that from one of the people that I work very closely with is be brave, because we now need to do things that we um, that are scary sometimes, and that take us that make us uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, whether it's putting on a mask for the first time and going outside or, or connecting with somebody by Zoom, following up on a friend that might not be doing so well. You know, it takes bravery to do those things too. And it takes bravery for all of us to support each other getting through this storm. Yeah, and it takes bravery sometimes on some days just to say, actually, I'm not feeling okay today. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so, you know, when... when That's uh, true kids are struggling. This is hard for kids. This is, is, their whole world has been thrown upside down. And uh, I know certainly that in the circles that I have the privilege of being in, and I've got two 13-year-olds, and uh, I I'm really impressed with the young people in this province. I actually think the young people in this province are in many ways leading the way for yeah. some of us who should be a little wiser. Um, <laughs> and behaving a little bit more appropriately. So I say hats off to the kids because I think they're doing an incredible job. I have seen so many innovative, fun things that people are doing to support each other mm -hmm. in schools. You know, the, the going back to school stuff, uh, kids have taken this on. They've shown that they are adaptable, they're innovative, they're, uh, you know, they're resilient. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn from that. Yeah, exactly. Because this is going to be a momentous thing. Um, a mentor's part of their life, and I, the young people in my life, when uh, my nephew finished high school in the in the spring, mm -hmm. and you know, what are the, it's a it's a changed world. Yes, um, university is remote. All of those connections and the social networks that you make at that point in your life are are changed, and the job prospects are. So we also, I think, as a community, as a, as a society, need to have um, supports for young people going forward. But I think the things that they're learning, and, how, and they're going to change the world from mm -hmm. learning from this. Um, and that's something that we need to celebrate. Yeah, great. Do you have any more questions? No, I, I don't have any more. No. Well, I mean, I could sit here and talk all night if you want <laughs> me to. <laughs> but. Well, I don't have any more questions either. Is there any final things that you would like to say to the yeah. teachers and students watching? You know, I, I, I do want to say I think um, the teachers and students in particularly, they've done an amazing job. Mm -hmm. And I know it's sometimes scary and it's sometimes we're muddling through and we're making changes and that's okay. 
uh, we will adapt to this. And I do want to say this is not forever. It's not forever. We will get through this. We'll be together again. It will be back in a different way and hopefully in a better way, in a world that, that we can have control over and make it more just and make it more friendly and make it kinder for each other. But in the meantime, then I remind you all to, to be kind and to be calm and to be safe. Well, thank you very much. This has been uh, a lot of fun yeah. uh, to sit up here under the spotlights with you. Um, so very, very grateful for that. And I know Alex has a few things he wants to say to close it off. Yeah, one, uh, one last thing. So before we close out today's Q&A session with Dr. Bonnie Henry, the students at Gladstone Secondary, uh, we got one question from them. And we've worked with them in the past. Uh, they've come to the in-person things a lot. Uh -huh. And so they always put together a nice little thank you gift for the speaker. Uh -huh. And they wanted to do the same again. So what we have down here is a digital illustration from one of the students, Tammy Leung. <laughs> she did so that. And then a bunch of the students and teachers uh, signed it as well. We won't hand this to you, obviously, uh, right now because of social Beautiful. distancing measures and everything. But we'll make sure that you get it. And so it just leads us to say, again, thank you so much for taking the time to get on the live stream with us today and answer the students' questions. As we we really appreciate it. Um, and also, of course, a big, a big thank you to the students and teachers uh, that have joined us today and that are watching right now. We'll see everybody again, hopefully, in an hour for the, for the main event, where we have three other panelists, including Dr. Bonnie Henry, Dr. Mel Crashton, from the, who, who, sorry, who is the medical director of the BC Center for Disease Control, who we've talked a little bit about in the conversation, and Dr. Carl Hansen, who is the CEO of Abcellera, a local pharmaceutical company. So thanks, everybody. See you in an hour. Thank you.